You're watching CBC. Good evening, I'm Peter Mansbridge. Tonight on Sunday Report, a dramatic exodus from Hungary. Thousands of East Germans, perhaps tens of thousands, are on their way through Hungary to the West. Just hours ago, the Hungarian government began allowing them to cross freely into Austria. The emigration was sparked by a recent trend towards greater democracy and openness in Hungary. Perhaps the most graphic symbol of that trend came last May when soldiers started tearing down the barbed wire fences along the country's western border. For the past few weeks, thousands of East Germans have left their homeland, traveling through Czechoslovakia to Hungary on tourist visas. They waited in refugee camps while the Hungarian government walked a diplomatic tightrope, torn between its role as an East Bloc nation and its recent democratic reforms. Today, the reforms won out and the waiting is over. Despite protests from the East German government, Hungary told the refugees they were free to go. NBC's Peter Kent reports. It was early evening in refugee camp number one in Budapest when East Germans gathered expectantly to find out what the Hungarian government planned to do with them. Hungary's foreign minister, Jula Horn, appearing live on the main evening TV news, wasted no time in announcing that any East German who wants to go to West Germany would be able to leave Hungary after midnight. The refugees, some who've been waiting in the crowded emergency camps for more than a month, were told that despite the East German government's demands that they be sent home, Hungary could not agree. <laughs> The foreign minister said Hungary is not encouraging East Germans to leave their country, but any who wish to, he said, may now pass legally through Hungary. On German television, West German Foreign Minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher thanked Hungary for its humanitarian decision. Uh, proof, he suggested, of Hungary's commitment to reform and human rights. Good, wonderful, happy. <laughs> After a lifetime under rigid communist rule, the East Germans in Hungary aren't holding back in celebrating their imminent move to the West. There are about 7,000 East Germans registered as refugees in the camps tonight, but the woman who spearheaded the relief effort says she now expects many more will decide to leave. Chilla von Busselager of the Maltese Catholic Relief Agency says Hungary, caught between East and West in the refugee crisis, made a courageous decision. Actually, I, I think they're marvelous. I, I didn't expect that they were going to be such a broad solution. They have been put in a terribly difficult position and they have taken a very courageous step and I think uh, the West will do well not to forget that they have taken a very courageous step. Relief workers are tonight trying to calm the euphoric refugees telling them there's no need to rush to the border. The transportation will be arranged tomorrow. You are going for the border tonight? Um, we Quite want far? to go. You want to go tonight? Tonight. Yeah. But many East Germans feel they've waited long enough and immediately began packing up and flooding out of the camps, heading towards Hungary's border with Austria en route to new lives in West Germany. By morning, thousands more will be on the road the greatest movement of people from the East Bloc to the West since the Berlin Wall was erected. Peter Kent, NBC News, Budapest. There was heavy loss of life in a ship collision this morning on the River Danube. A Romanian passenger ship capsized and sank after colliding with a tugboat near the city of Galati. Only 18 of the 179 people on board the passenger ship have been rescued. Romanian President Nicolae Ceausescu has ordered an inquiry into the accident, which happened in poor visibility. Here at home, the first real salvo has been fired in the NDP leadership race. Until now, the competition to replace Ed Broadbent had been a fairly peaceful affair, but that may have ended today in Victoria. One of the candidates, Stephen Langdon, accused his rivals of offering nothing but rhetoric. They, in turn, argued the Ontario Member of Parliament offers even less. Anna Maria Tremonti reports. 
Up until this point, the candidates for the NDP leadership race have confined their comments and their criticism to issues and ideas. But on this stop in Victoria, the debate became personal. It's time to get beyond the mush of some of the rhetoric. Stephen Langdon took a broad swipe at the other candidates. But my op opponents have mostly responded with few specifics and limited substance. He was especially critical of Audrey McLaughlin, the candidate Langdon considers his stiffest competition. Good leadership means seeing the eyes of the world through many eyes. Leadership seeing things through many eyes doesn't tell us what clear direction you want to take this party in. McLaughlin refused to return the volley. Well, I think people should do what they want, you know. Mr. Langdon. But the other candidates were clearly angry with Langdon's comments. Well, I think that's an Steve style. And I uh, personally feel that's the style uh, which will uh, ensure that he will not be the leader of the new Democratic Party after the election. Howard McCurdy says Langdon's speeches calling for a new radicalism are loaded with rhetoric. Uh, I think if you want to find uh, a vagueness, ask about what that new radicalism is. I think I understand what radicalism is. Radicalism is on the street. I don't think Mr. Wet Mr. Langdon even understands the streets. Langdon says he is only trying to coax his fellow candidates into serious debates on issues important to the NDP. They say they're already doing that. But his comments have left some of the candidates on edge and now a little more willing to be nasty in what was once a polite leadership race. Anna Maria Tremonti, CBC News, Victoria. New Brunswick's newest political party, the Confederation of Regions Party, or CORE, has elected a leader. He's Arch Pafford, a sculptor, and he has a vision of a unilingual English New Brunswick. If Pafford's party is elected, it promises to get rid of bilingualism in Canada's only officially bilingual province. Susan Ormiston reports. New Brunswick's new political party has a message for the Premier and the Prime Minister. We are not the model bilingual province that they profess us to be. The Confederation of Regions wants to end legislative bilingualism, first in New Brunswick, then Canada. I challenge and demand that you start uniting the people of this great land of ours by leading the way to an English-speaking province. Thank you. CORE has attracted mostly older, rural English voters. They came to this convention harboring fears and frustrations that speaking English only won't get them ahead anymore in New Brunswick. I've got nothing against the French people. I've got a lot of friends that are French. And I just hope to God that this doesn't have anything to do with friendship. But as far as I'm concerned, the government is tearing people apart. Real resentment, though, is just below the surface. Well, they could get out the old guns, as far as that goes. CORE has 21,000 members in New Brunswick and boasts it will win seats in the next provincial election. But this pollster says its appeal is limited. I don't, I don't see a great swoop to the, to the CORE party. I don't see the majority of New Brunswickers supporting CORE or opposing bilingualism. And the leader of French-speaking New Brunswickers says CORE won't get what it wants. You can bring 10,000 people if you want to the CORE meeting. The kids and community will not accept idly sitting down any going back on linguistic rights. With this convention, CORE has set itself up as the defender of English rights. In a province where a third of the people demand French rights, there is bound to be more tension that the government cannot ignore. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Fredericton. One of the recent scandals to rock Newfoundland's Roman Catholic community is about to go under intense scrutiny. A judicial inquiry opens tomorrow into allegations of a cover-up of sexual abuse at the Mount Cashel Orphanage. It's one of three investigations into charges of sexual abuse involving 18 members of the province's Roman Catholic community. The allegations in this case date back to the mid-1970s. But as Brian Dubray reports, They've already had a strong impact on the community and on the boys living at Mount Cashel today. The Mount Cashel Orphanage has been home to thousands of Newfoundland boys. For most of its 90-year history, the institution and the Irish Christian brothers who run it were a source of pride for the entire community. It's been 12 years there, and i got to say it was fantastic. John Bambrick lived at Mount Cashel during the 1940s and 50s. He used to boast of being a Mount Cashel boy. 
but not anymore. I was always proud to serve in Mountcastle, but now people say to me, John, you were in Mountcastle. Was it like that when you were in there? And, uh, you know, uh, I don't like hearing that kind of remark. Those remarks followed a string of allegations by former residents that they were sexually and physically abused during the early 70s and that the Justice Department of the day covered up the whole affair. We were beaten, sexually abused. I mean, beaten by day and sexually abused by night. It was like, you know, physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, it was quite tough in there. Ever since the case was reopened last spring, eight brothers and former brothers have been charged with sexual assault. In Her Majesty's name. And the province has convened a judicial inquiry to investigate the alleged cover-up. The often graphic allegations of abuse and the almost daily headlines have been especially hard on the 45 boys who still live at Mount Cashel. Even though all the charges date back to the mid-70s, many of today's residents have felt shame, been taunted at school. We've brought in uh, consultants, uh, people who are in counselling, to help the staff uh, assist the young people in dealing with their feelings and their uh, angers or their uh, fears, uh, anxieties. The scandal has also jeopardized Mount Cashel's future. A $7 million modernization program has been put on hold. And the Christian brothers, who today make up only six of the 30-member staff here, may leave altogether. I hope we'll be able to uh, see our way to maintaining the service here. Uh, but I think we have to be quite open and uh, quite realistic regarding the, the future. Tomorrow morning, a judicial inquiry will begin hearing testimony into exactly what went on here and how it was kept quiet for almost 15 years. It will be a painful experience, not only for those directly involved, but for everyone connected with the orphanage. Brian Dubray, CBC News, St. John's. The government of Quebec has made another offer to striking nurses. The province has offered to set up a three-person mediation board as its gesture to break the logjam in the dispute. But there is one condition. The nurses must end their illegal walkout before the talks can begin. The union representing the 40,000 striking nurses has yet to respond to the offer. It's shaping up as a momentous week in Polish politics. Parliamentary meetings have been going on all weekend to choose a new cabinet in a new government led by Solidarity. Tuesday is decision day. That's when Parliament votes on the cabinet. Half the nominees are union supporters once rivaled as outlaws. The CBC's Patrick Brown is watching this unprecedented attempt at transition from communist rule to democratic ideals. As he reminds us now, Poland has undergone major changes before in its long history, and Poles themselves are more than experienced when it comes to the task of rebuilding. The cobbled streets of old Warsaw are something of an optical illusion. They're not old at all. Where people now take a Sunday stroll, 45 years ago there was nothing. Old Warsaw was completely destroyed by the Nazis. These buildings are replicas, rebuilt right after the war to the original specifications. The costly reconstruction at a time of great poverty was a statement of national identity. At about the same time, the Soviet Union was making its architectural statement about Poland's future with the gift of the Palace of Culture. Sunday strollers can go up to the 30th floor for what's known as the best view in Warsaw because you can't see the Palace of Culture from here. This Polish architect says there's been talk lately in the profession of demolishing it. He said like that, that they should destroy this building and suddenly a lot of people make for him love or they were happy about this idea. The thinking exemplified by this Stalinist monster is being demolished in the Polish parliament, where prospective ministers have spent the weekend appearing before committees, an entirely new way of doing things. This is Defense Minister Florian Savitsky, who led the Polish contingent in the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia. Answering questions from the sort of people he went to Czechoslovakia to suppress, he said the invasion was wrong. As for the committee hearings, I think they're valuable, he tells the committee member. There's now no hesitation in asking or answering questions. It's good for everyone. And here's committee chairman Jacek Kuron, once a much imprisoned dissident, greeting the man responsible for his imprisonment, Interior Minister Czesław Kiszczak, who, like the Defense Minister, was reappointed to reassure the Soviet Union. Kiszczak says he's looking forward to serving in a solidarity-led government.
Mazowiecki is the right man at the right time, he says. It's an enormous opportunity to pull Poland out of its difficulties. In committee, the man the police used to interrogate is putting the questions to the top policeman. It's quite a change. <laughs> yes, he says. In a way, I suppose it is. The new government will represent a dramatic change. But if Poles are to build the kind of country they want, a normal country, they're fond of saying, then a new government is just the beginning of a huge economic and political reconstruction project. Patrick Brown, CBC News, Warsaw. It looks as if Mikhail Gorbachev will become the first Soviet leader to meet a pope. Moscow's ambassador to Italy says a Gorbachev visit to the Vatican is on for late November. <music> Toronto's answer to the Cannes Film Festival is now in full swing. The 14th annual Festival of Festivals is a 10-day movie marathon featuring 322 films from 38 countries. This year, the festival is honoring the achievements of Canadian women filmmakers, and as Gillian Finley reports, audiences are learning that the recognition is long overdue. Fifteen years ago, it would never have happened. A sellout performance for a Canadian feature film made by a woman. Good, thanks. That woman is Anne Wheeler. Wheeler's latest film, Bye Bye Blues, is a war story set in the Canadian West. I'm not there yet. Almost. Come on, get ready. Daisy Cooper's husband is at the front, so she takes a job with a local dance band and discovers herself. It's based on the experiences of Wheeler's own mother, and last night was received with a standing ovation. The last five to ten years have been good ones for Canadian women filmmakers. With movies like Loyalties and now Bye Bye Blues, women directors like Anne Wheeler are being acclaimed all over the world. But Canadian women making films is not something new. Unbeknownst to most of us, they've been doing it, sometimes against great odds, for more than 70 years. The first Canadian film made by a woman was in 1919. Nell Shipman was not only the star, she wrote it, did her own stunts, and supervised the editing. But it wasn't until the war and the creation of the National Film Board that women started making films in a big way. They were ready wherever they were needed. With so many men at the front, women had new opportunities, and they told their own stories. Jane Marsh Beveridge is now a writer, but during the war, she was one of the many women hired by the NFB's John Grierson. What happened was he showed me how to uh, run a movie only, and then he tossed me into the cutting room and said, OK, you're on your own. And I didn't know one end of a little piece of film from the other. But I sort of worked it out. Worked it out to the point where she was making some of the NFB's most popular films. And Marie Trombley, his wife, comes in from the vegetable garden to make supper for a hungry family. Like the women she worked with, Beveridge saw her job as capturing the images of Canada. And that, says festival curator Kay Armitage, is their legacy. They were carving out the history of Canada. They were, as Grierson has said, uh, revealing Canada to Canadians. But they were also being ignored. Beveridge was making some of the NFB's best films, but she says her male bosses rarely allowed her a credit, wouldn't even let her sign her own work orders. Because I was a woman. And what difference did that make? It made a hell of a lot of difference in those days. Okay, we had a little flubber there, eh? Today, women who make films say it is getting better, but only because they're making it better. I think it still is a struggle for young women filmmakers, and uh, what I try to do is that on my crews, it's 50-50. On the crew, it's 50% men, 50% women, um, and I'll accept no less uh, in an effort to make it easier for those women. <laughs> But still, women have more trouble raising money, more trouble getting their films produced. Kay Armitage says filmmaking is still a man's business. I would really like to give an optimistic answer and say, oh yes, women are emerging. There were over 60 fi feature films made in Canada this year. Four of them were by women. Two of them are showing in this festival. So, 70 years after the first woman made a film in this country, the women who are still making them say not much has changed. Gillian Finley, CBC News, Toronto.
And when we come back, tonight's panel. As we told you earlier, the NDP leadership race is now in full swing. All candidates' meetings and debates going on around the country. So why is everyone talking so negatively about it all? We'll try to answer that when we're joined from Halifax by Alexa McDonough, the NDP leader in Nova Scotia, from Ottawa by correspondent David Halton, and from Toronto by columnist Jeffrey Simpson. A new look for our old railroads? On Venture Tonight, private capital moves in on public transportation. And the facts behind Vancouver's stock market frenzy as the latest gold rush hits town. Coming up on Venture right after Sunday Report. Well, a little bit of action in Victoria tonight, and one has to wonder whether that kind of confrontation between the candidates will help put this race onto the front pages. Jeffrey. Well, I don't think so. This is the B team, after all, running for the NDP leadership. Uh, none of them are going to send uh, shivers up anybody's spine. I suspect the uh, left-wing candidate in the group, Langdon, is going to get more uh, attention from the other candidates, and the, what we've seen in Victoria is possibly what we'll see elsewhere. But really, it's a small ripple in an otherwise pretty placid pond. David? Well, it's almost self-evident, Peter, that these candidates aren't uh, setting the NDP on fire, let alone the Canadian public. Uh, but in fairness, it seems that the media is really giving uh, these candidates a bum rap. Uh, they've decided that this is a boring race. They're not covering it properly. Uh, there's very little coverage coming out of the all-candidates meeting so far. One example, when all of the candidates come uh, out against the official NDP policy of supporting Meech Lake, and that doesn't get any headlines, that seems to me an example of some pretty slothful media-packed journalism. Well, Alexa, a couple of comments there to react to. Uh, do you think overall that perhaps we in the media and those in the party, some of them, are being unfair when they talk about the race so far? I do think it's uh, a bit unfair. I'm glad someone else said it first at the <laughs> moment. I think the main news about the NDP leadership race is that a lot of the media are whining from the sidelines. I'm not sure what people were expecting, but the race is just getting underway. Uh, it's not the greatest time of the year to attract people back to town hall meetings, but I think uh, there's something like 13 yet, yet to go, and I think uh, the interest is going to build. I won't pretend that I think it so far has the uh, command of the Lendl Becker finals in the U.S. Open, but I, I think it's building. <laughs> well, you must admit, though, uh, when you look at the lineup, a lot of the criticism has been focused on, on the six who are in the race and I, I look back at the comments you made, uh, Alexa McDonough, on the weekend that Ed Broadbent resigned. You, you said that there were likely six probables in the field at that point. Of those six, only one actually is now. So I think you know, a lot of the attention has been focused candidate-wise that this field isn't good enough. Well, I don't think there's any question that there was a lot of disappointment, and I was one of those who shared it, uh, that there weren't some others who were going to enter, but I think that uh, that will fade now, now that the race is actually underway. I've never seen so much attention on the early, early stages of a race, and I guess for that we should be grateful as well. But uh, it's a bit of a new phenomenon. I don't know whether all the uh, excitement around uh, John Turner entering the Liberal race last time did the Liberal Party any good in the long run. I don't know whether all the hype around Mulroney uh, winning the Tory leadership last time has done either the Tory party or the uh, people of Canada a whole lot of good. So I don't think you're going to find New Democrats too spooked, even though the media generally do seem to be whining that they're not uh, finding it entertaining enough. I, I don't know to whom, to which New Democrats uh, Ms. McDonough is speaking. I have not spoken, Peter, in the last three or four months to a single New Democrat whose attitude towards this race is other than a rather ill-defined despair because they know and they say in private in no uncertain terms that this is a B-team race, that all of the A-team candidates, including Miss McDonough, who would have been an excellent candidate, have all decided for a variety of reasons to take a pass. And I'm that comes together at a time when the NDP has just fought eight consecutive election campaigns with the same relationship to organized labor and basically the same approach to Canadian politics and they are caught in the same rut of 15 to 20 percent. I'm not sure, Jeff, I agree with you on the fact that there's this despair in the NDP ranks about not having a star candidate. A lot of the party faithful are looking at the Ed Broadbent experience. Here was the leader, the most popular leader of any national party for several years in the Mulroney first mandate. Where did it get the party? It got them at the 20% of the total vote, just one in five of Canadian voters. I think there's a sense now that perhaps getting the star candidate is not the solution to the party's problem. Just one last point on the candidate question. Do you think we're looking at the final slate 
or is anybody talking about somebody yet to still come into the race? Alexa? I'd be surprised to see anybody enter yet. I think uh, any serious candidate would know they should be there at the starting gate. There was obviously a bit of uh, uncertainty about whether Lauren Nystrom would enter, but that's now definite. I don't expect you'll see anybody else enter the race uh, beyond this point. Um, I haven't called my grandmother today, but uh, apart from her, I don't will think we'll see anybody else in the race. Well, David, you were mentioning, uh, or somebody was mentioning a moment ago, the unions. Uh, there, there seems to be, at this point, a, an uncertainty among many of the big unions about who to support, and still a lot of talk, possibly, about Bob White. There's a lot of talk, Peter, and still some pressure on, on Bob White to come into the race, but even some of White's advisors admit now that if he comes in at this late stage, it's going to look awfully arrogant. It's going to look as if he does feel all the other candidates are wimps. Not a very strategic moment to go in. Okay, I just want a last thought from each of you, and it's about the issues that are being discussed, because I was at the first meeting in Winnipeg, and I see again tonight that one of the biggest applause uh, factors from the crowds in attendance is still focused on the past criticizing the party for what went wrong in the last campaign instead of talking about what's going to happen in the future. Now, how much of a problem is that? Are they talking about the right things? Ms. McDonough first. I certainly think it would be disappointing if that's where the focus remained for the rest of the race, but we do have several months to go and uh, some 13 meetings to go. I think it's healthy for the party to air concerns about where uh, we got into trouble in the last election, and certainly it was a great disappointment. But there's some very major issues out there to be tackled, and I, for one, would be disappointed if the focus doesn't shift and uh, really tackle some of those tough issues. I think that's what you're going to see happening from uh, here on in. Well, it better, because it's totally counterproductive to dwell on the past, particularly the election campaign, which the New Democrats haggled over for months after the campaign. Look, the party has been caught in a rut 15 to 20 percent for eight consecutive elections. But you know, Jeffrey, that if there was no discussion about uh, problems that arose the last campaign, you'd be the first to say, see, they don't want to deal with that. So I think in a way, Alexa, we're damned if have, we do, you, we're damned you, if we don't. You dealt with that splendidly on the front pages of all the major newspapers of the country in the months after the election. It's time to get on, as you just said, and I agree with you, to discussing a whole range of future problems. But the key is, unless some or all of these candidates can break clear of the shibboleths of the NDP that have brought them the same result for eight consecutive elections, then it doesn't much matter, in my view, who the next leader is going to be. Okay, last quick point. We're almost out of time today. Well, I think what we're seeing, Peter, is the old dichotomy in the party between the NDP as a party of principle and as a party searching for political power. The tendency now is to go back towards saying we must have a party of principle, but look at the successful labor and social democratic uh, parties in the world, in government in Spain, in Australia, New Zealand. They're all parties that have come to grips with the modern economy by taking some tough updated decisions. All right, I thank you all. The next couple of months are going to be very interesting ones on this story. And with that, we close this edition of Sunday Report. Thanks for watching. For CBC News, I'm Peter Mansbridge. Join us again tomorrow for the National, but stay with us now for Venture with Robert Sculling.